our guest tonight is the prolific, prolific author. <laughs> I've got, um, I've lined up some of his books here. <laughs> it's very heavy stack and that's not, you can't see the, the other ones, they're down there. <gasps> Lots more and there's even more on my Kindle. Um, Frank Parady, who is um, Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of Kent. Um, and for full disclosure, Frank was my PhD supervisor back in the early 2000s. I don't think he saw that much of me, but um, I was raising babies at the time. So <laughs> I was a kind of elusive PhD candidate, got it done eventually. Um, and subsequently worked together at the University of Kent researching changes in family life, uh, in particular trying to understand the rather newfangled uh, thing called parenting, uh, which Frank had spotted was a sort of new a term that was being used to describe family life. And so we were exploring what that meant and uh, the kind of implications of this sort of new terminology, this new set of language, which is being used to describe um, what people have obviously done for, um, you know, hundreds and thousands of years. So, <clears throat> but even before that, I realized that I remembered quite recently that I first saw Frank speak over 25 years ago. Um, and he was speaking about the perils of political correctness back then. Uh, and I still have my slightly dog-eared copy of uh, a book of his I read as an undergraduate called Mythical Past, Elusive Future, History and Society in an Anxious Age. And that was published back in 1992. And that made a big impression on me at the time. So he's a very influential um, uh, historian, sociologist, uh, writer, thinker, who has influenced a lot of people. And a lot of people find him uh, to offer a really helpful way th through of thinking um, the kind of the incredible disruptions of the last 30 years or so. The main things that we want, uh, that are obviously so relevant to the Free Speech Union are the work he's done around uh, democracy, tolerance, and freedom of speech. Um, but tonight, I think what um, I was hoping we would focus on and really try to pick Frank's brains about is what is this thing called woke? Um, it's a term that many of us have ended up using, sometimes reluctantly or apologetically, uh, in the absence of any other way of describing um, what's going on. So I thought, first of all, Frank, I'd ask you what it is that we're trying to describe when we identify something as woke. I think that's a very difficult question because uh, there are so many names that people have used to describe the people that are promoting what we call woke from the metropolitan elite to the cultural elites, to the correctorate. I think I once made a list and there's about 12 different names that people have tried to apply. And the problem with, uh, that we're faced with is that there's a movement afoot, uh, which is what I call in my new book, uh, motivated by an ideology without a name, which uh, hasn't got a coherent, systematic worldview that it puts forward, but which nevertheless, in a very predictable way, always reacts very paternalistically, always attempts to uh, sort of uh, police the language that people use. It's very much in 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 invested in controlling the social rules that we live by. And it's got a, a very sort of very clear and very defined uh, sort of agenda about controlling our lives and, 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 and changing the way that we live without consulting us. So in the book, I, I've tried to sort of uh, make sense of this. And in, in my studies of going back almost a century, I've come to the conclusion that what woke is really all about is the synthesis of two separate forces that have been in place for uh, almost 100 years. Uh, and these two, two forces are, first of all, what's called American progressivism, which is principally motivated by the desire to reform our lives and, and to bring about not the kind of reforms that ordinary people have demanded and, and wanted, but the reforms that they think we need to be better people. So that's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, uh, you have uh, what kind of reinforce, which, which kind of drives it along, is what I would see as being a kind of form of technocratic governance, which is a kind of liberal, in a kind of uh, neoliberal sense, kind of movement that relies on expertise and technocracy as a substitute for democratic public policy. And it's the synthesis. I think that's really quite important. But I could just say one thing 
uh, which uh, I think is absolutely crucial here, is that what we call woke, the synthesis of these two separate forces, has never been so influential and powerful if its rise had not coincided with the unraveling of the conventional ideologies of, mo of, mo of the modern world. You have to remember that the precondition for this kind of ideology, this politicization of identity to emerge, was first of all, the uh, unraveling of liberalism. Liberalism itself had reached a certain impasse and found it very difficult to give meaning to the kind of genuinely liberal ideals that motivated people like uh, Mills and Locke in an earlier time. But it also coincided with the unraveling of conservatism and conservatism had become a victim of its inability to, uh, to deal with the world that, that the liberal uh, kind of society has created. And also it had very much to do with the destruction and the internal corrosion of Marxism and socialism. I think the disappearance of these three ideologies were crucially important. In fact, the, the first person to understand this in a clear way was the social critic, uh, sort of Christopher Lash, who already in 1990 made the point that what this kind of, what we call woke today is, has got nothing to do with liberalism, has got nothing to do with Marxism, has got nothing to do with any of the old ideologies, because those ideologies haven't got the cultural resources to motivate and to create new radical ideals, but it's very much uh, a beneficiary of the demise of these ideals. And I think the exploration of woke is difficult for a lot of people, because if you're invested in liberalism or conservatism or socialism, you have to admit that you, in a sense, have, have, uh, are bearers of, a, of an outlook and an ideology that no longer has any real resonance in the 21st century. And you have to therefore understand that what you're up against is a, is a very powerful force that's been parasitic on the failure of your own worldview to make sense of the world. Right, well, that's, that's big. <laughs> so if we can sort of go into some of the things that you're, the kind of terminology you're using there and the way because most people don't, they tend to come at woke as, oh, it's, it, it's, it's a continuation of Marxism, or it's a resurrection of Marxism, it's Maoist, or this is neoliberalism gone mad, um, you know, or so, although most people, I don't think anybody says it's conservative, do they? No, but, 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 the, the, but a lot of uh, conservatives, unfortunately, yes, find, right. find it difficult to uh, acknowledge their own uh, failure to deal with this phenomenon. I think what a lot of conservatives have done is having failed to, to kind of account for their own impasse, they kind of blamed other forces for the rise of woke. Somehow it's, it's they got this theory that uh, woke has been this march through the institutions, you know, sort of that there's been somehow they, you know, you know behind, our, behind their back something has happened. And I think there's a, you know, I, I think it was Christopher Lash who made the point, I think very profound point, basically explained to an American audience in a, in a, in a very good article in a journal called Sal Gamundi, that actually the idea that culture, that there's a, such a phenomenon as cultural Marxism, which could give birth to this new radical movement made no sense because by that point, Marxism in any of its form had become so exhausted that it no longer had the capacity to motivate and to inspire. And I think it seems to me that that, uh, that kind of combination of different ideologies losing their way was very, very important uh, at that time. And um, so when you say it's a synthesis, can you then, is there, does that mean it's very difficult to identify one thing that is the kind of core idea? Or would you say there is something that is the kind of the core idea that is the thing that all of us are labeling woke and that we kind of instinctively feel that there's something here that, that sort of is that runs through lots of different things, whether that's the trans phenomenon, whether that's, um, you know, some of the kind of new uh, race theories? What, do, you know, is there one, is there something at the core of that? I think there is, I, I think at a certain point, precisely the moment 
that uh, a number of books were written on the topic of end of ideology. And when it became very, very clear that the, the radicalism that was emerging uh, was very alien and very different to the previous forms of radicalism. Precisely at that point in time, he had the invention of this idea, which we are, we are now very familiar with, which is the idea of the personal is political. And, what, what the, and the idea of the personal being political is very, very important because it not only eroded the distinction between public life and private life, but it basically uh, suggested that what was really important is what mattered to the person. So that personal identity and uh, the need to validate that identity and to recognize and to celebrate it was far more important than the debates going on about the Cold War or the debates going about taxation or about social policy, all the boring political subjects. It basically suggested that this will be the terrain on which the future of the world will be decided. And when it emerged in around 1970, 1971, people laughed at it. Nobody took it very seriously, except a few hardcore feminists, a few hardcore members of the gay liberation movement, a few hardcore black activists, a few ex-leftists. They, they were the only ones that kind of bought into this. But look at it now, look at the world as we live today, where identity has become everything. Identity has become a form of political destiny to which, this is what the, the interesting point is, to which every section of the existing political establishment gives way to. I mean, isn't it interesting that it's under a conservative government in Britain, first with Theresa May, and now under uh, sort of Johnson, that we have the institutionalization of trans culture. It's not Corbyn, and it's not kind of radical leftist people who are bringing that in. And isn't it really interesting that, you know, from the Corbynite left in the Labour Party, all the way through to the, to the Johnson, you know, sort of establishment in, in the Conservative Party, there is this kind of buying to trans, transgenderism. I mean, how did that happen so fast? I think the only way you can explain it is first of all by the absence of, of, of their own ideals. I mean, they are really are running on empty. When you actually look at the intellectual resources that is available to our political establishment, which they actually put forward, it's conspicuously weak and shorn of any kind of future oriented ideals. But at the same time, what has happened is that they've allowed the institutionalization of identity politics to the point at which they become not only their prisoners, but they also become in many respects, their passive advocates. Mm -hmm. And and to what it, so, uh, um, but the, the hollowing out of, I don't know, of elite thinking or the capacity of the elite to think um, through in a kind of way that could possibly uh, offer leadership or a profundity or a sense of meaning, I mean, which comes first? So, you know, we can see with the universities, for example, they kind of they've lost their way in, in, in being able to think through the big questions of humanity. Um, and, you know, and across various other institutions that now are caught up in, you know, what we call the culture wars. Uh, is this where are we at at the moment, do you think? Are we at the kind of is it why has it suddenly become obvious to us? <laughs> why are we suddenly able to say, OK, this is a woke thing. This is there's a culture war here. Why? What's changed more recently? Well, if you take the steps one by one, the first thing that occurs and this began in the university system, first of all, was the highlighting of two, di two different strands of wokeness, the, the authority of the expert. Right, became very much uh, seen as being uh, the most important form of validation. No longer religion, it was no longer a political ideology. It was expertise that, be, that was kind of put forward. And you find that, for example, from the 1980s onwards, the governments of every Western society no longer said this policy is good or bad. They said this policy is backed by the expert. It's, it's evidence-based. That's the expression they use based on research. So I think on the one hand, you had that emerging on the university. And at the same time, you had the beginnings of uh, uh, the, the momentum of identity politics gaining more and more traction. Now, one of the things that, that's the first step, the second step that occurs is that at a certain point, the political establishment realizes 
that what I call technocratic government, governance or the rule of the experts lacks the moral depth to gain legitimacy. It doesn't attract people, doesn't motivate people, doesn't inspire people. And therefore what you had was that a section of the political establishment began to draw the conclusion that the way they legitimate their technocratic impulses was by using uh, the popularity of identity politics in the university system as a way of giving them legitimacy. Now, the interesting thing is, is that people still talk about the university as the main site of what's really going on. People say, oh, it's the university, but actually what has happened, this is why we're talking about it now, is because it just migrated out of the university about 10 years ago, and it began to dominate and capture every important institution. I mean, most importantly, nobody imagined. I, I remember debating people in New York five years ago when I said, you know, university is not the most important place where this is, gonna, where this is going to be an issue. Look at business. So now what you have is a situation where you have the phenomenon of woke capitalism, where all the large corporations, the, particularly the tech, uh, technology-based companies, but also in finance, have mission statements that could have been written you know, by a transgender activist from a university. I mean, they are, you know, it's almost like the same person writes all these mission statements everywhere. So you have the universities, in a sense, kind of, kind of being taken over. And, and as you have the universities being taken over, you kind of look around and you'll find that there is not a single institution. Now, I remember this is, you know, this, I remember this very, very clearly. Then a year after this debate in New York, I was in Nashville, which is, which is not exactly the wokest place in the world. And in Nashville, I'm, I, I'm explaining that this, this has got a powerful impulse behind it. And then somebody puts up their hand and says, look, Frank, what you don't realize is that there are still places where wokeness can never gain any, any influence. I said, which ones are those? And they said, sports. They said, sports in America will never, ever give way to a wokeish cultural impulse. Now, this year we know that sport has become just like business or the university. I mean, I'm a football fan. I go every two weeks to watch a home game. But, and now what I see is people taking the knee routinely. And now what I see is in America, you know, sort of sport, you know, sort of kind of flaunts its wokish credentials and promotes its identity oriented, you know, sort of, uh, sort of interest to the point at which you even have people in the world of rugby who are saying, well, actually, we don't want to discriminate against trans athletes, you know, sort of. So what I'm really trying to say is that I, now I cannot think of a single institution which has been able to stand up to this pressure. The only, the only area where there's been any kind of uh, holding the line has been in small towns, in local communities in the Anglo-American world. It's only in place like I live in a small town in Kent that is really on the cusp at the moment. It's fighting back, but you just know that the... Uh, influence of the elites, BBC, all these institutes is very, very strong. But in America, where there's more localized democracy, there are more, many, many states, there is still opposition, but it's a very local, diffuse, unclear one. Thank you. There are so many uh, questions and comments coming in. I'm just going to go out to the floor because it's a bit daft for me to be uh, carry on asking you questions. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think universities are very important uh, because even before the mass expansion, they already had a very significant impact on public life. And it's, what I find very, very interesting is that if you look at the way that universities are, you, could, you, have, you have a situation where what the universities have done is to re-socialize young people so that their outlook becomes uh, quite distinct and quite different than the rest of society. But it doesn't stop there because then when these students, especially the really bright ones, go on and get an MBA at a prestigious institution like Harvard or Yale, they basically take those ideas into, the, in, into their business administration classes. And one of the things that I've done is I've been looking at the Harvard <laughs> Business Review over the last 30, 40 years. And what you will find is the Harvard Business Review 
actually mirrors the discussion that goes on in the universities and uh, re-socializes executives and corporations and in business to be more or less the mirror image of what academics are like. So the, from the universities onwards, what you got is a spread of this particular outlook that goes in a, in a large, uh, in a different kind of a way. I think what the pandemic has done is it really accelerated trends that pre-existed it. And it brought to the surface some of the sentiments, but to be honest, these trends were already very powerful, even in the years leading up to it. But because at that point in time, they weren't as violent as for example, the way that the BLM is, and they weren't as forceful and aggressive. A lot of people didn't really notice it, but what we call cancel culture, has been around for almost two decades beforehand and it's been getting gradually more and more uh, influential. I think what you, can, what you can argue is that what there is in many parts of society is what, I, what, is what you can call a conservative mood. In other words, there are a lot of people, there are millions of people in Britain and elsewhere who want to conserve a particular way of life that they think is important. They are really committed to maintaining a degree of cultural continuity with the past. And therefore there's a basis for a conservative movement. But what is really lacking is actually the ideas and the politics and even the parties that can actually do that properly. So one of the things you notice is that everywhere you look in you know, France, Italy, Britain, America, there's, there's a, the conservative mood is actually quite tangible. But the people who have this mood of conservatism are not able to give expression to that in any, in any kind of political shape or form because they cannot voice their sentiments unless they, they, they get the assistance from people who are able to stand on their two feet in public life and, and, uh, and advocate on, on, on their behalf. So from a conservative point of view, I think there is hope. There's a lot of hope. If, if people are conservative minded, would get their act together and instead of playing the role assigned to them in the conservative party as it now is, actually took upon themselves to initiate some kind of conservative uh, renaissance where you try to give uh, meaning to conservative ideals that's appropriate from the 21st century. But I think that a similar thing goes for liberals. I mean, uh, I think liberalism uh, in it understood properly in its, in its classical sense is essential. I mean, liberal ideals such as tolerance, free speech and freedom, which are really been quite important, really do need a, a, a much stronger uh, sort of intellectual and moral foundation. And for me, the hope lies in the fact that if you recognize the problem that uh, this ideology, this wokeness represents, then we can begin to do something about it. And one of the, to me, one of the most uh, positive developments in recent times has occurred with the rise of transgenderism. Because whereas people can ignore many of the other manifestations of wokeism, transgenderism directly impacts on their very humanity. It calls into question what it means to be a human being, what a person is. And I can see, uh, the kind of reaction to it indicating that there is a real appetite for uh, no longer just hiding behind the bush and, and, and not doing anything, actually standing up and hopefully um, joining the battle because the battle that we're engaged with, the culture war that we're involved in uh, at the moment is, is fought vigorously by one side, the other side, but our side is conspicuously uh, sort of slow on the uptake. Well, it's very complicated because if you are silent and if there are millions of silent people, you, you don't know how many there are and you don't know how passionate they are about their belief. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, so therefore silent majorities, even when they're physically uh, numerically a majority, don't count for very much if they're unable to give voice to their sentiments in public life. And in particular, don't count for very much and all the cultural institutions that are important from the museums to Netflix to Hollywood to uh, television 
and all these universities all controlled and they are all controlled by the other side. I, I think that we have a, a mighty big battle on our hand, but I, I think that what, what, what really, you know, sort of, in, you know, kind of makes me feel relatively optimistic is that up to this point in time, what we call wokeism has, has not really been seriously tested. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been a serious attempt to take them on. All that you had in the last 30 years are people writing books, moaning about it and complaining about it and grumbling about it, but not doing very much more than that. And I think that now is the time to leave the grumbling behind and take ourselves a little bit more seriously. The way you answer that is, is this, I think that um, the, the thing about wokeness, and I, I, I kind of talk about this at length in my book, is that it hasn't got a public profile. It doesn't announce itself as woke. It's not a systematic ideology. It's an ideology without a name. It self-consciously uses a language that is opaque, so look at the words that woke people use. They all avoid uh, being held to account. So the kind of words, language they use is inappropriate. You know, take the word, you know, what does that inappropriate mean? It doesn't mean good or bad, it's just inappropriate. But they know exactly what they're getting at. They use words like problematic. This is, they don't say it's a problem or this is wrong, it's problematic. They use kind of the kind of words they use are all problematic and inappropriate. Or they say, when I criticize somebody, they say, Oh, Frank, I'm very uncomfortable with this. What does uncomfortable mean? You know, I'm not here to make you comfortable. <clears throat> Why, you know, what does that mean? Basically, what they're saying is they disagree with me. They think I'm wrong, but they don't say that. So when you look at the kind of uh, ideology that they, uh, they kind of embody, they are all conspicuously opaque and diffuse. It's like a bar of soap that goes right through your hands. And I think that to suggest for one second that this is an invention by right-wing uh, ideologues uh, is basically uh, an argument that they use self-consciously as a way of obscuring the role that they're playing within contemporary society. So our job is to nail them is to demonstrate that in fact, on all the crucial issues of the day, of the, of, of the day there is a woke voice. You know, there, it's very clear that they are saying something consistently. And not only that, but they are the ones that are raising the stake. I'm not telling a trans person not to dress, you know, sort of a, a trans boy, not to dress like a girl, that's their business. I'm very open-minded. If you wanna make a, you know, wanna dress like that, that's your business. But they're telling me that when I see somebody that looks like man in my eyes, I should avoid what, uh, thinking what my eye, eyes tells me. And I should basically agree with them that what I'm seeing is not a boy, but a girl. So they basically are the ones that are consistently imposing their views of the world on us rather than the other way around. And I think they're uh, intolerant, authoritarian, uh, sort of uh, political views is something that you know we can point out and expose and not have to be defensive and say oh yes this is just a right-wing conspiracy we're just inventing this because it's there it's tangible and it's front of our eyes. These kind of silencing words that carry great weight because amongst a certain layer the young they know what dead naming means so that you're not supposed to do it but everybody else is floundering around saying what on earth have I done <laughs> I've just referred to somebody who's only just announced that they are the opposite um, sex to the one they were born as and have changed their name and this is now two days later and I'm used the previous name and that's dead naming and that's a kind of sin so there's all these kinds of words which are just the silencing words the phobic words and all of those kinds of things so it would be interesting to really get into this um, not just the policing of language but how that it's a demand that we change our perception as you said there's a demand it's not that just we just be kind by using the right pronouns actually that we change the way we actually see things or if we do see things a particular way we, we think somebody does look like a man uh we can't share that with anybody else and therefore you must undo your own 
perception and which is very different obviously to insulting somebody or to being rude or, or whatever that might be. I wish that it was just a handful of people that we're talking about here. Uh, I think you're right to draw attention to the financing of the transgender movement. I mean, it isn't just the person you mentioned. For example, George Soros and the Open Foundation are one of the big fu funders of transgenderist politics in the United States. And if you look at the latest annual report, <clears throat> the Open Society brags about the fact that their objective is to make sure that uh, trans identity or, or self identity, where you identify your gender in accordance with your wishes, is given a le legal recognition. So there's a, a lot of big fund foundations are promoting this. It's a very complicated one because at first I, I like, like a lot of other people, didn't believe that these woke companies actually uh, took seriously what they were saying about identity and about identity politics. But then what happened was I did a little study on the public relations and advertising industry and realized that you know, within that, that world, uh, the identity issues are really dominant. They really are vetted uh, emotionally and, and, and from a business sense to seeing identity related issues as the medium through which they can sell products, but also as something that they themselves believe in and feel really good about. And I find that what's happening within industry is, and, and, and in different businesses is they become not all that different to academics, kind of woke academics that are in two or three decades ago. They really try to live the life, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them try to live the life that is prescribed by woke, you know, woke virtue, vir virtues. So therefore, I think the eco economic question <clears throat> is very difficult. I think that we have to, you know, do what you suggest, you know, sort of give two fingers to Ben and Jerry's. But at the same time, we have to recognize that uh, when it comes to the, uh, the corporation, especially the big corporates, you know, we are facing a mighty big battle at the moment. Uh, and we've got to find some economic strategy for uh, uh, ensuring that their way of life is challenged by a way of life that, puts, that separates economics and politics. You know, <clears throat> the key thing that has changed is that in the past, this was the economy and this was politics. Business was about making profit and politics was about doing the right thing for the public. Now, corporations have taken upon themselves to be our political mentors. And I think that uh, loss of boundary is, a, is, a, is really a big problem which we've got to reinstate quite clearly. In, the, in my book, I, I talk a lot about the role of psychology and the way in which psychology has become the medium through which identity politics uh, has gained traction and has developed a certain amount of appeal, particularly among the, uh, what those people that you could call the, uh, the, the therapeutic class of individuals who are involved in health and public services, you know, so who've been very much drawn into this. I think that uh, the very fact that identity begins as a, a clinical term in its initial uh, usage and, it, and has a very clear, definition in terms of how it was used in psychology uh, indicates that uh, there's a very clear link between the way that identity related issues are often linked to concerns about mental health and i think that it's not an accident that what we call the mental health crisis uh, which is the inexorable increase in the number of mental health diagnosis and psychological conditions that we never heard about run in parallel with identity politics. And uh, I think earlier on, somebody asked about pandemics and identity politics. I don't know if you realize, but there has been 12 or 13 new anxiety related uh, syndromes invented uh, during the pandemic to explain very simply <clears throat> why it's so difficult for us to leave the lockdown behind. 
And I think that in many respects, the what I call therapy culture and the cultural politics of identity are very closely uh, interrelated. And uh, as, as, as Ben said, the, the uh, industry, the therapeutic industry, the pharmaceutical industry has been totally won over uh, by wokishness. And, and uh, if you look at their, the magazines, they are often the worst uh, advocates. You know, they really go to great extremes to work out justification as to why identity is everything and nothing else matters all that much. When people talk about a vacuum created by the um, decline of Christianity, it should be seen as a symptom because a lot of things have declined along with Christianity that are just as important, right? The decline of conservatism or the decline, for example, of liberal ideals of tolerance in its, in its proper sense. They've all declined at the same time. But I think what, what I would say is being really uh, important to understand is that what the really important issue here is not Christianity as such, but the Judeo-Christian tradition, which was inextricably linked to what I see as being uh, essentially civilizational norms, <clears throat> particularly to do with the West. And once that's kind of pathologized as it's been done, then there is, it's very difficult for people in our world to make their way in the world in a positive kind of a way. I think that you have to also understand that uh, both the Christian and the Jewish religions have been uh, taken over or, or uh, excessively influenced by woke ide ideologues. I mean, when you look at Pope Francis, and his idea of what Catholicism means. When you look at Reformed Judaism and their ideas about what Judaism is, if you look at you know, the Church of England, uh, which, which when you go into the Church of England, uh, sort of church where I live in Kent, you know, every single poster is not about Christianity, but it's about something else. And it's usually some kind, if it's not, if it's not about environmentalism, it's about some kind of a woke cause. So there is a problem here. I think the uh, unfortunate thing is, is that the institutions that really matter are on the other side. And just to give you an example, something I'm passionately concerned about. Imagine you're a seven-year-old child going to school in England and you arrive in school and the teacher tells you, little Mary, little Johnny, you know, you might think you're a boy or a girl, but wouldn't it be more exciting if you discovered your real gender over the years? Little Mary and little Johnny or seven are not in a position to argue back there. They haven't got the intellectual resources to do that. But what the teacher has done is basically unsettle those kids to thinking that they actually may not be girls or may not be boys. And when this happens, and it's happening in a lot of times, I mean, I looked at the at the course material that teachers give, to, you know, these worksheets that are given to children, it doesn't really matter what happens in the Queen Elizabeth Center. It doesn't matter how many messages Boris Johnson sends a, a group of activists, because within the key institutions that socialize young people, in other words, that influence the future generation of our society, these ideas are, are kind of gradually becoming the norm rather than the exception. And therefore you'll find that it's very complacent to imagine that we're just talking about a little minority. It, it, they may be numerically a minority, but in terms of their position and their influence, they are in a hegemonic position as far as that culture is concerned. As an educator, I know that there is literally no pushback within the teachers' unions. There's very little pushback in, amongst academics you know, where, are, where is the counter force to this? And these are the people who are creating the outlook, the world views of the next two or three generations that are coming along, mm -hmm. right? It's not anybody else. So don't be complacent because I think they have tremendous power, tremendous influence. I 
I don't know if you realize, but it's it was in the uh, among legal scholars that the idea of critical race theory was was developed, and law schools are actually the, the one of the most woke. They're as woke as, as as sociology, my discipline, or English literature is in terms of their attitudes. And the and what has happened is that the the legal profession has been kind of won over, which is why I, I agree with the one of the last speakers who wants to get rid of hate crimes and equality laws. There's only one other thing that I would add to that we could do without is the is human rights legislation, which tends to be one of the most pernicious ways in which uh, woke ideology gets transmitted into the public domain. I agree. In, in the book, 100 Years of Culture, where I draw a parallel, um, there's one very important uh, point of similarity, which is the Cultural Revolution in China tried to rid China of its past, right? And basically argued that we're starting with year zero. So it put forward a, an idea of year zero history. The movement against statues and the movement against uh, Britain's and America's history is very, very similar. Because what they're basically arguing is that we, you know, you know Britain's past is just an irredeemably bad sort of series of horrors that Britain inflicted on the world. And therefore we should really feel a sense of shame and leave that thing behind. <clears throat> and this war against the past is really quite important because if we become the, you know, sort of uh, dispossessed of our past, then that would be the single biggest victory that woke politics has, has inflicted upon our society. Because once we have, we no longer have a past, that foundation uh, in our, our, of, of our legacy is gone, our traditions are devalued, then in a sense, there's very little left that we can use to make our way in this world. And therefore their values, what they're promoting, will have a much easier possibility of triumphing. So that is, a, is really, really important here. Somebody has asked in the Q&A about, you know, uh, do you feel that the more narcissistic individualistic societies are prone to wokeness in the Anglosphere than more community-based societies. But I was also wondering how does this fit with, so why an embrace of woke and at the same time, a kind of reluctance to talk about Islamism? <laughs> that does, that's very hard to square, or it seems like it's quite hard to square. Um, but also the way this kind of breaks down globally. So I noticed this week, you know, or maybe last week, Vladimir Putin, uh, ridiculed the West because of what we're doing around gender neutral child rearing and said, look what they're doing over there. This is just ridiculous. A boy's a boy, a girl's a girl. And that's the way it is. Uh, and they're screwing up their kids, basically. And I don't think he was saying it out of concern for us. <laughs> uh, and similarly, the people have told me that the Chinese have their own term for us doing woke to ourselves. Um, and they've got a, you know, they've got a, I don't know what the word is, but they have a word to describe that. So how does that, how does this play out on a, on a global level? Well, the way that it plays out is you have to realize that everything that we've been talking about originates from California and the United States. I mean, it's, it's in California that a lot of these woke ideas have been first put into practice decades and decades ago. And what you have is a gradual sense in which American soft power, which we haven't discussed yet, has been a, the main vehicle for globalizing woke ideas. I mean, if you don't understand what I'm saying, if I'm, not, if I'm being unclear, all you gotta do is just watch a Netflix TV series and, we, and, and they, or a Hollywood film these days. And all the characters that are sensitive, intelligent, emotionally literate, they are either you know, into identity politics, they're either trans or they're gay activists or they're, 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 or, or they're kind of black, you know, strong black women who unlike their white equivalents, you know, sort of uh, has got a real, you know, sort of sense of responsibility. It's very difficult to find a white heterosexual man uh, in a heroic role in any of these productions. So American soft power has been very, very powerful. Somebody else in the Q&A 
um, said, well, what about Joe Rogan? What about Jordan Peterson? It only seems to be America that actually throws up these popular counterpoints. Um, Tucker Carlson. So, uh, and over here, I can't think of, maybe you're it. <laughs> Who's it? Toby's it. You're it. Are you the kind of the equivalents of Joe Rogan and Tucker Carlson uh, in the UK context? Um, you know, where, why, why in America, it does seem like there's a bit more space to have a, a bit of a tussle over this, at least, is there or not? I think America is more pluralistic and it's got different states with different traditions. And I think it's interesting that when uh, they tried to cancel Joe Rogan in terms of his show on Spotify, uh, Spotify realized that actually Joe Rogan's podcast is more popular than anybody else's, so they couldn't really do it. And when they tried to cancel Peterson uh, uh, and not publish his book, Random House, they, they realized the same thing. I, uh, he's Canadian, by the way, not American. Sure. But, but, but anyway, I, I think there are a number of individuals like Dave Chappelle and a few others, you know, who are standing up against this because there's more space for that. I think, unfortunately, here in Britain, you know, we're still at a very early stage where we have popular figures with big followings who are able to do that. And I think that in general, the discussion in, in Britain is usually about six months to a year behind Mm -hmm. discussion is in the United States. So that's, I think at the moment, the, the battle, the culture war is fought at far more explicitly in the United States than here in Britain, where we're much more gentle. We're kind of tiptoeing around the issues. Mm -hmm. We're scared to dead name, you know, sort of trans people. Mm -hmm. Whereas in America, they're not. Well, that's interesting because somebody in the chat, I just, I can see people putting up suggestions of Rod Liddell, Jonathan Pye, uh, and actually J.K. Rowling just came out and I thought, well, that is interesting because she is the kind of much more of the kind of British softer sort of resistance to this. Um, very respectable, obviously a children's author, not even a kind of, you know, Michelle Welbeck, you know, it's a different kind of order of things. So, um, yeah, and people are now posting up lots of names of possible kind of figures. As it happens, I'm a Canadian myself. I kind of grew up in Montreal. And so I'm, I feel you know, a bit sad that Canada has become so, so, so woke. Uh, more than, you know, I mean, British people have no idea how bad it is in, it is in Canada. Uh, I think that you're right about the industrialization of identity. I think that's very clear with the trans industry. It's also very clear with the mental health industry, which has just expanded enormously. I mean, the, I mean, the number of people, uh, I, I got a, some figures in my book, the number of people that are being employed in therapeutically related, related jobs is just expanded massively. And I think all those things are really quite important. I think what's happened is that in many respects, there's been a fusion between the service sector, uh, people that are involved in providing personal services, trainers, counselors, mentors, all these individuals that uh, believe that they can make our lives better for us. Uh, they really are in the forefront of advocating identity-related politics. And uh, uh, I mean, and as, a, as any, any parent would know, there are more parenting experts around that than rats. I mean, they're just everywhere. I, I don't think that's the main driver, but it's a very important uh, force that, 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 that kind of coexists with this development. It's, it's the economic side of this. And I, I really wish I could find some young people to do research on this. And I think particularly to do research on the way that the advertising industry and the public relations industry works, because they're the key here. They're the ones that are providing the material, the script, the narratives, which are then used by, both by companies, but also by the activists. Maslow's self-actualization is really quite important uh, in many ways because his idea of self-actualization neatly converges with uh, a very kind of capitalistically self-oriented, uh, it's all about me kind of ideology. Uh, I, in many ways, I always think of the Me Too movement, which is a really all about me movement as like the latter day expression of the self-actualization moment of which Maslow was one of the most articulate exponents. I, 
I had a very opposite impression from my work and research on, on parents. Uh, I've noticed that, you know, sort of uh, woke parents, uh, in a sense, are distinguished by the fact that they, you know, sort of uh, brag and boast about the fact that they got a trans child. They are almost like they kind of use the identity of their child as a way of making a statement. Woke parents, rather than cultivating resilience, seem to be in the business of cultivating their children's vulnerability. And, and typically, most woke parents that one comes across or one reads about are not in the business of, of, of cultivating their children's independence, of letting them go and explore and take risks in the world. They typically tend to uh, sort of um, organize their life, over-organize and over-schedule their lives to a, to a considerable extent. So I see, I, I see this very, very different. There's an organization in the United States called Let, Let, it, Let Grow, which, which is trying to cultivate resilience among kids and talking to some of the people involved in it. They, they understand fully well that identity focused adults and parents tend to be extremely uh, sort of uh, ob obsessed with their, with their children to the point at which they, they kind of continually uh, limit their capacity to cultivate their freedom. Uh, so I, I see a very, I, I don't see, I mean, unless you want to call that conservative, I see that as, as being some, that's a, a, a kind of form of technical expert led form of parenting, which in my book violates the meaning of conservatism because conservatism is about using your intuition. Conservatism is, is, is very much about not uh, ignoring the advice of your parents, your grandparents and your ancestors in favor of the experts. Uh, it's a very different kind of, uh, kind of approach. In fact, woke parenting self-consciously criticizes grandparents. They say that grandparents is either superstitious, they're wrong, we should ignore them because, we, we, because we're now so knowledgeable about child rearing that we don't need to have their input into their lives. So I see that a little bit, uh, a little bit differently. Uh, I, I mean, you know, not that there are individuals that, that might contradict what I'm saying, but by and large, I think that, that that's the way that I see it. I'd just really like to thank Frank. I know you you do this stuff all day. You talk to lots and lots of people in lots of different audiences. So I really appreciate you making time for us. Um, I would really urge people to order the book uh, from Amazon. It's, it's really, really brilliant. And also you can order any of these ones as well. <laughs> I'm not selling mine. So you have to buy other people's older copies if they're... Uh, Although you, you said today that you're um, you're now devising plans for the next one, so having produced three in the last year, uh, the next one suits you to come as well. So um, thank you all for coming. Thank you very very much to Frank. Make sure you encourage your friends to join the Free Speech Union. Uh, it's really obviously so important that we just get the word out and uh, and make it clear that this is a campaigning organisation. It's a lobbying organisation as well as representing uh, the rights of its members, and that we need to kind of add weight and make it very visible that um, there are people who are standing up and making it clear that, it, that they're going to say no to these kinds of developments.